Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Hey, and thanks for listening into the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr., and I'm pleased to be joined by pastor and author, Reverend Carol Howard Merritt. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Well, it's awesome to have you. Um, You're a Presbyterian pastor right now, and you have an interesting past in a similar background to mine as a Baptist and a fundamental Bible college student. So I'm hoping we can talk a little bit more about that. And you have written quite a few books, and we're hopefully going to touch on the themes of one of those. So what else uh, would you like our hearers to know, listeners to know about you? Uh, let's see. I'm Right now, I am moving in the middle of COVID. Or are they, I heard somebody talk about it as COVID today. Um, anyway. COVID? I've not heard that. Pandemic. No. I'm moving in the middle of the pandemic. So I'm surrounded by boxes, just so you can get mm. some scenery. Um, yeah. it's very exciting boxes and lots of wrapping paper and, uh, you know, a lot of chaos right now. So, uh, that's, that's me at the, at the moment. Um, but if you want something more interesting, I am, uh, I'm, I have, a a husband who I also met, um, on a mission trip to Hong Kong, China and the Philippines and wow. a daughter and we were I was like 15 and he was 17 um and I have a daughter who is going to college of the holy cross and um wow yeah yeah so our lives are are pretty much up in the air right now uh-huh. <laughs> hoping to land soon somewhere <laughs> so if you have boxes all around you it's like a perfect rec- recording studio then essentially yeah, right? right that's what we can imagine yes Oh man, I can only imagine moving right now. I know. During this I stuff. I, I mean, I feel sorry for the movers. They're going to have to wear masks and, you know. Yeah. Hot. Yeah. Well, tell us about, tell us a little bit about your story, uh, how you grew up, and uh, what faith looked like for you early on. Well, I was, uh, as you said, so Southern Baptist, um, kind of the mean sort of Baptist. And, uh, you know, they, we didn't believe in women ministers. We thought that was, uh, you know, an abomination and, uh, (laughs) and women were pretty much, um, you know, baby cookers. Like (laughs) that's that's what we did. And, um, and so my, I have felt a call to ministry and I, pretty much knew that I could either marry a pastor or maybe I could be a good pastor's wife, yeah, be yep. a pastor's wife or, or, or an organist, but I, I sucked at playing the organ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, or I could be a missionary and missionary mm-hmm. to have a pretty interesting life. Yep. And so, um, so I went for that. I decided to become a missionary and went to Moody Bible Institute. And, um, I remember going to, uh, Uganda and Kenya. And while I was there, um, uh, they made me one of the, the preachers of the group and, oh, wow. Yeah. And so it was preaching. I was with the Anglican church, which is, you know, they're, they're kind of horrifyingly, um, conservative now, but, yeah, but, um, they were actually pretty liberating for me. I, I almost wow. hate to say that, but, um, cause they've done terrible things with the LGBTQ mm-hmm. issues. But anyways, so, so I was there and became one of the main preachers of the group. And I would just kind of look around and see, um, a sea of African faces. And I began wondering like, well, why is it okay for me to preach to black men, but I can't preach to um, 
white men in the United wow. States. Yeah. And so all of that, plus many, many other questions kind of came crashing around me. And, um, and so after a long struggle and, uh, you know, I became Presbyterian and still had a long struggle after that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my, uh, that's my story. What is, what is the, was there a moment in time? I know you referenced that moment in Uganda. Was there another moment or a few moments in time that for you, you, you think back on as like a switch where you really kind of something changed in your, your faith or your understanding of God that kind of took you to the, on your path that you are on now? Oh yeah. I mean, there were so many moments, you know, mm. sitting there preaching in Uganda. I remember going to a church where there was a woman minister and how shocking that was and amazing yeah. that was. Um, and being able to sort of see myself as, uh, as that person. Um, but yeah, so many moments of clarity and discernment as you know, I begin to get out um, out of evangelicalism and, and the particular fundamentalism that I was a part of. And what would you say is something that's changed about your Christianity from the past? Well, I think before um, there was a sense of Christianity as a rule book, you know, these were the things that you could do. These were the things that you could not do. And there was almost a sense of like, we were going to try to figure out how much we could get away with in a way. Yeah. You know? And, um, and so, you know, you're always like struggling with questions, you know, as a teenager, well, can I go to second base or third base or, you know, can I drink a beer? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it became very much about the rules and regulations and how much you could get away with without losing your salvation. And, and, um, you know, and part of that is just, being a teenager, you know, the, the whole right, process. Right, yeah. But now I think Christianity is much more about living an abundant life. How do we become more fully human? How do we become, um, uh, how do we become the person that we are created to be in all of its, uh, amazingness and variety and um and and that's that's it for me you know it's it's how do we do that and when there is something in christianity that goes against um living a life of abundance uh you know i th i think it's important to rethink it i'm still st stuck on that image you brought to mind about you preaching to african men and maybe it's just the time and place we're living in that like it's shocking almost to think about how essentially they're setting those you to you and your group up in that time to think of those people as less than right because if you can if you're not supposed to preach towards like white men in America and I don't know if your tradition was I remember growing up Baptist and there's some ideas of like could women be youth pastors like at what age could women stop teaching males right right and it's almost like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems almost this unaware racism of these people are less than it's, it's shocking to hear, but I guess it shouldn't be. Yeah. Oh, no. The, I mean, you know, the whole missionary endeavor is, is chock full of <laughs> shocking racism. Yeah. Colonialism. But, yeah. Oh, so right, much. Right. But it, it definitely was. I mean, I just had this sense of, Wow, this is really racist and sexist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and um, and and it's kind of it was just this profound moment of of uh, realizing the system I was in. Wow, I remember a couple, a few years back, my old youth pastor, who was very formative in my childhood, in my youth, growing up, and even in my call to ministry. He came back into town, and they're doing some kind of they're honoring him at this youth event. And I'm like a good pastor. I'm like, I'm going to get up here and talk because I'm a pastor. And I remember talking to this group of teenagers, these very conservative group of teenagers talking about them. 
hey, some of you here are going to go into ministry. And I, as I've spoken, I kind of felt pain thinking about like, no, only half of these really have a shot because the women, the girls don't. It's, that's too bad. It's a loss for so many of these communities of faith. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'll recall another moment, which I haven't been able to find this um, quote. So I may be wrong about it, but I remember being in Moody and reading um, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez. I used to, you mm-hmm. know, sneak him out of the out of the library, and uh, and so I was reading this liberationist theologian, and I I remember it saying something like. If you are not accepting women into ministry, then you're cutting off half the body of Christ. You're cutting off half of the people who could be speaking. Um, yeah. And and it just struck me at that moment because it was the first time that I had really read uh, this quote as not just oh women, you know, wanting to be um uh you know horrible feminist but there was a sense of um the church was sinning by cutting off women yeah and so that that struck me too and you know of course um it's all in the new testament when when the women came back they weren't believed that they saw jesus Tell us, uh, tell our listeners, if you would, what's a spiritual practice that you've developed and might recommend to others? You know, when I was in seminary, I really felt this calling to write, but I I wasn't very good at it. And um, sometimes I was good. Sometimes I wasn't. It was kind of hit or miss. Sometimes I'd get in the flow. Um, and and someone recommended me to uh, do the artist's way. And so, and basically it's kind of a journaling program um, where you write three pages every morning. So I began to do it and um, got really into it, began to get into the rhythm of it and everything. And my practice began to grow more and more. And so then, um, so then I ended up writing every morning and, um, and it's been life changing, you know, in so many ways, you know, even if I wasn't published, it would be a really life changing thing to, to wake up in the morning, be alone with my thoughts, be able to hear what I am thinking um, without the influences and constant buzz surrounding me. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Well, let's move on to the section I'm most excited to talk to you about and hear your perspectives on. Um, so you wrote, you wrote a book, what, published in 20, 2017, Healing Spiritual Wounds, talking about spiritual trauma. Right. So first, let me ask this question to start. What's the more appropriate term, spiritual trauma, religious trauma, how do you define it? I don't know. Either, <laughs> either one is okay. good. Um, I think, you know, some people say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Um, so maybe some people would be more comfortable with religious trauma, but I use the words interchangeably. Okay. And how would how would you most define it, best define it for, for us? You know, it's interesting because I remember going through a really difficult time. Um, my father was dying and um, and I was having to come to terms with a lot of the things that he had done when we were growing up. And mm. he was very violent when we were growing up. And much of the church, when I had tried to get help or when my mom had tried to get help, um, we were told that, you know, women should submit and children should submit and, and that it's part yeah. of our cross to bear and all of the horrible things that women are told in those situations. So I, I was trying to work through this and I really wanted to have peace with my dad before he died. And I went to a therapist and I began to tell the therapist what was going on. And the, the therapist was an, uh, uh, an atheist. And 
we weren't getting very far. Like we would get to this point um, where he could help and recommend me with certain things, but we weren't getting to, I felt like the heart of the problem, which was, um, you know, wrestling with the idea that God set up these rules and my parents were, uh, you know, trying to live this Christian life and um, these rules really hurt me. So yeah. I began to realize that, you know, it wasn't a psychological thing. It wasn't being uh, addressed within the framework of psychology. It wasn't like physical trauma, even though I had um, gone through, you know, some some physical abuse. It wasn't necessarily physical mm-hmm. trauma, but there was something else that was happening. There was some other wound that was coming up for me. And so I began to understand it as um, spiritual trauma or religious trauma. And there wasn't really much written on it at the time. And, um, you know, that's why I decided to write the book is because sometimes you just have to yeah. that you wish you had, you know, and, uh, and I began to kind of identify it as, you know, I, I would list it out things that I had experienced things that my parishioners had experienced things that my friends had experienced. And I noticed there were some patterns and, you know, it comes back to the core of like loving God, loving others and loving yourself. And, um, and I begin to realize that oftentimes spiritual trauma happens when, um, your love for God has been skewed. So if okay. you are taught that, um, that God is an angry God, that God would, you know, burn you in a lake of eternal fire if you didn't parrot the words of a, yeah. of a prayer, correct? Yep. You know, that's an angry God, right? Um, you know, imagine a God who's, you know, would put you into the uh, ovens of the Holocaust, but you would never burn. You would just be tortured forever. You know, that, that's a God that's yeah. like worse than Hitler. Yeah. It's hearing you say it, it just sounds insane yet there's so many people who believe that literal thing right right so you know this this image of god is very skewed and so um so and it, it's it's harmful and to imagine that we have like this uh evil santa waiting for us to make mistakes so that <laughs> they can you know put us in a lake of fire is just awful so that's that's the first thing is um you know when there's been damage to our image of god then the second thing i think um we're told to love others as we love ourselves and many times you know the reference point for that is that we have to love ourselves but oftentimes we uh we don't have that um, idea of loving ourselves in in religions. Sometimes uh, religions, um, they will uplift suffering or uplift martyrdom, or um, they will, you know, make it so that you have, I mean, I'm, I'm a Presbyterian, so I'm going to go against my Calvinism, but, you know, we're well, people yeah. that they're totally depraved you know, yeah. or, you know, a wretch or a worm or, you know, a sinner in the hands of an angry God. And, and all of these things are, are incredibly damaging to a psyche. And I mean, you've got kids. Would you ever like go to your little kid and say, you're a horrible person, you're a wretch, you're a worm? You know, it's funny you bring that up. And I remember, I swear I remember being taught in church or growing up in in Bible college that like having kids would make you believe in the sin nature of humans. And for me, it's been the opposite. I'm just like, how can you believe that these little ones are just bad? It just, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that too. And going through that whole experience and thinking, 
Wow, you know, I'm not the best parent in the world, but I would never tell my daughter she was a wretch. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes I might feel like it. (laughs) But so why would this God who is much more loving and caring and, uh, you know, why would God do that to us? Um, It just doesn't make any sense. And then, and then there's this idea of love for others. You know, right now we have a religious landscape in which, you know, Christians are perfectly okay with little children being locked up in cages um, on our borders. Yeah, that that's wrong. Like there, there's just something wrong there. And um, so I believe that the political and social justice. Um, aspects come into this as well um, when we begin to either open our eyes to the injustices that have happened to us or the injustices that have happened to others. So those are those are kind of the areas that I see um, this this idea of our love for God, others, or self when they have been marred in some way, some harmful and tragic way. So that leads into another question I was going to ask you, Carol, early or later about how much of this is bad theology or, or what we classify as bad theology versus bad leadership or structures. But so much of what I'm hearing is, is foundational, like just what I'd call bad theology. Yeah, you know, I think they go hand in hand in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, you know, I will say that even though I don't like the idea of total depravity, I do appreciate it in our structures. I do appreciate the fact that we have this um, ability to have, you know, checks and balances and and the understanding that um, pastors will not be perfect and church leaders will not be perfect. And I know that I have been working within our denomination to try to figure out some of those structures. So when a pastor um, inflicts harm on a uh, on a member or another human, um, and I've been working a lot with clergy sexual misconduct. You know how do we how do we deal with that appropriately? In which in cases where we can be caring for um, the church and for the victim and for the minister, uh, how do how do we deal with that appropriately? So. So I think we have to do both. We have to think about the structures and we have to think about the theology. Um, it starts with the theology and moves out from there. But, uh, but, but definitely, I think we need to be thinking about both of those things. It's interesting you, you talk about total, total depravity of structures. Would you classify that separately as like humans, individuals not depraved and structures tending to go to depravity? I don't know how to ask the question, I guess. Well, you know, I think about it and, uh, you know, as much as I hate the theology and hate saying um, that people are totally depraved and I do not believe it, I also really appreciate the genius of Calvin's structures. So he took this idea and decided that basically um, uh, that people could mess up. And so he made sure that there was a system of checks and balances within the church structure and within the governmental structure so that when, you know, when the president messes up, there are uh, the Congress is there to make sure that there is a system that keeps them in check or vice versa. And um, even though I think we're, we're watching that break down a bit right now, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. but, um, but ideally I think that's a beautiful thing. So in some ways, um, because have you ever been like part of a, an almost utopian um, group of people who decide that they're going to do church better or make church better or do um, organizations better. And, and they end up, they just do the same thing. Like the same stuff happens. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I haven't been a part of that, but I think like every new church or new institution 
kind of has that kind of big idea. Yeah. And like we were just watching, I was just watching Hamilton, which aired this weekend. We're recording on this on July sixth, and I'm thinking about this like in regard to like the black Black Lives Matter movement, how there's been wow. so much movement or energy to change, and now it's kind of like, well, now they got to kind of see if they can figure out how to make this work long term, right? right? Yeah, I mean, I I've been involved with. Um, um, my husband was very involved with Occupy where they thought, oh, we're going to, you know, yeah, get parks yeah. and create this utopian sort of ideal. Or you know, we've started, he started mainly a new church or, um, or, you know, I've started organizations where you think now it's really going to be different. It's really going to work. And, and it, we all just mess up. Like we're all just humans. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So what do you, maybe I'm jumping ahead. What do you think that's about or or what can institutions, churches, organizations do to, is it just about good policies and procedures in place? I mean, you know, you do try to do that. You try to make sure that there are good policies and procedures and that people aren't um, just kind of, the issues aren't just swept under the rug and, pastors are moved from church to church, that women or, or people who have been victimized are believed. Um, you have to make sure, mm-hmm. I think, that there are intentional spaces that we open up for people who have been hurt by the church so that they can talk about their experience and what happened to them. Um, there are just a lot of things I believe that we can and should be doing as churches um, with the realization that, uh, you know, we're going to hurt each other. And um, sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's not intentional, but these wounds are going to occur. And so how do we become, you know, hospitals for sinners or how do we become those places where we can be healing? I want to I want to touch on that because uh, that, that kind of is that seemed really profound to me, this idea that we're just going to hurt people. Is that like, is that the biggest problem that we go into church expecting it to be this perfect utopia and not understanding that we're going to make mistakes and people are going to get hurt? It sounds too harsh, but correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah. You know, I think that's probably true, right? We, I mean, as pastors and as church leaders, you know, nobody's going to church to have fights and to deal with. <laughs> Sometimes they are, right? Yeah, right, right. But, uh, you know, so we do have this idea that we're going to come together and we're going to be a light and hope for our community and that we are going to become better humans in the midst of it. And a lot of times we do that very thing. You know, if you look around the country and think about, all of the hospitals and homeless shelters and yeah, um, yeah. all of the things, you know, educational institutions and things that churches and Christians have started. Um, it's amazing what we have done, you know, unbelievable what we have done. Yeah. But yeah, we, we also hurt each other and, um, and we are, you know, we're, we're people who tend to harm one another because we're working together at the same time holding up these incredible ideals. I'm afraid like what I'm hearing is what I feel like so much of life is about is just it's complicated and it's, it's complex. Right. And obviously we want to do things that we want to be as proactive as we can to keep people safe and not hurt people. But yeah, it can be hard. Yeah, I know. Every once in a while, I'm like, oh, you know, it's a group of women, and we're going to do this together. And because there's no men here, we're going to be, you know, women with yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, we, we, we have this ideal, but, but we're all human, and then we all just mess up. So... <laughs> So I think if you have the structures in place, realizing that, um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, 
mess up. We're going to try to do as much as we can to prevent harm. Um, but also when it happens, we're going to listen to people and open up our, our lives and our hearts and um, make that space for healing. Is that one of the most important things? I know you mentioned that earlier about uh, opening space for the hurt. I was going to ask, like, what can churches do to heal wounds? And is, is that like the most basic fundamental thing that churches can do? I do think so, because oftentimes we have like this whole bevy of gaslighting. <laughs> it's like theological gaslighting, yeah. where we either, um, you know, hear somebody's story and we quickly say, oh, well, you know, all things work together for the good. You know, it'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's figure out why God made you go through this or, or we might. That gets back to the problematic theology right, right there. Right, right. Or we might, um, you know, hear somebody say something and, and we quickly jump to, um, well, they couldn't have done that. They're a great leader of the church. Yeah, Look how much this yeah. person has done in the life of this congregation. There's no way he, he would have done that. Um, so you begin to, you know, not, not believe victims or... Um, you know, so there's all sorts of things that we use or we use our structures to hide things and, and we're afraid that we're going to get sued or we're afraid that, you know, we're going to lose our standing in the community. So we really tend to try to hide things and keep things hush hush. And, and many times we end up hurting ourselves in the long run. Um, because of course, just like anything else, the best thing to do is to acknowledge what happened and, um, make sure that we can work through the chaos and the reconciliation at the end of it. So what I'm hearing is transparency. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as much as possible, um, especially uh -huh. when you're in the middle of, in, when you're working with the church, uh, because churches also, as organizations, they also go through trauma as well. Yes, yes. I don't think people talk about that enough. The first church I served as a solo pastor, probably 20, 30 years ago, there was a pastor who, their pastor committed a murder-suicide. Wow. Yeah, and even 20, 30 years later, the trauma was still evident in the church and they didn't want to talk about it. And it was, it was kind of shocking to, to see how that institutional trauma had stayed with them. Even people who weren't a part of the church back then, but had kind of received that trauma from prior members. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's real. And, uh, and churches tend to develop patterns um, when in the midst yeah. of of that sort of trauma, and uh, and if they aren't able to get out of it, they they stay in this cycle, and and it's really difficult to pastor a church like that because you bring, <laughs> let me tell you, <laughs> yes, you try to bring it up and you try to uh, to deal with it, and many times um, people in the congregation just say, no, we we need to put it in our path, and um, that's almost never an option because <laughs> you just keep reliving it. That's the challenge is that people want to pretend like it didn't happen or move on. But like we know you, you're going to have to deal with it one way or another. So you might as well just right, be right. open about Super it. Super hard. Now, one thing before we, before we take a break, I want to ask you about this. It seems like most of, most of your work or most of the work, at least in general, when talking about religious trauma is is talked about in the sense of what, what churches or pastorals or, or church leaders do to like congregants or church people. And I can't help but to notice like there's a lot of trauma that happens to pastors and church leaders. And I'm curious just um, if you've reflected on that or what. Yeah, I mean, that has been the biggest criticism that I've gotten of the book. When pastors read it, they're like, oh, this is great. But what about all these big scars I have? 
my body, you know, because they have gone yeah. through so many things. Um, and so I actually did start a book. Uh, I haven't finished it, but I, I started one on, um, you know, the, the wounding that, um, leaders go through and, and I began to listen to, um, listen to people and listen to what we go through. I've certainly suffered religious trauma myself, uh, at the hands of parishioners. Um, you know, it, it, it can be extremely difficult because for me, it's the barrage of criticism, just kind of constant criticism. And you're, you're also, um, constantly held up against people's nostalgic ideas and they're not actually real, you know, (laughs) like I think of the people of Israel, you know, and, 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 or they weren't the people of Israel, but the, at the time, but you know, the sons and daughters of Uh Abraham and Sarah, and they're, they're wandering through the desert and they're just longing to go back to Egypt and they want to go back to this place where their children were enslaved, yeah. their women were raped, their yeah. um, sons were beaten to death, and they want to go back. And I, I often think, like, why would why would anybody want to go back? And I just think that's the power of nostalgia. Yeah, it's a gift in some ways because you are, you know, you don't remember the trauma. You don't remember the harshness or the bad things that happen um, or else nobody would ever go back to Disney World for the second time because they they don't remember the long ride. <laughs> the kids screaming. Exactly. Hot, they only remember the great 45-second <laughs> ride that they went on. I I still remember all my suffering for when my son was six months on a Disney cruise. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, I just think that um, you know this this incredible gift that we have to be able to look back on memories as these rainbow shiny things um, actually work against us as ministers because we are often compared with those rainbow shiny days, and we'll never be able to live up to yeah. those. Never, never. I, I've become a real fan and student of systems theory or family Absolutely. systems theory, which I imagine you're familiar with. And the idea of sabotage, like something I really kind of latched onto and appreciated. But one of the things I've begrudgingly accepted is probably the, the vast, vast majority of the time is sabotage isn't even something people are cognizantly doing. Like no one's like thinking, oh, I'm really going to just sabotage my minister here. They're just it's something un, unwilling, almost unwitting that they're doing and they don't even usually recognize yeah. it. That, so that's wait, what makes where it did you read about it? Well, I've, right. I've become a real big fan of Friedman, Edwin Friedman. Oh, yeah. Edward, is Edwin? Yeah. Edward? I always forget. Yeah. Friedman. <laughs> generation, generation. Yeah. Generation, generation, and then a failure of nerve, something that I'd appreciate too. There's a lot of great authors even now still working on. Absolutely. in in those... Um, those lessons of like how family organizations function and how we communicate with the, each other in healthy ways and unhealthy ways have been extremely important in um, in dealing with many of these traumatic situations. Well, I'll ask you then to keep working on that book for pastors because I know no, I- I'd read it and I'm sure many others would too. Well, let's take a break and we'll come back with our closing questions. All right, we're back with Reverend Carol Howard Merritt. And just some simple closing questions you can take as as fun or serious as you'd like to. And the first question is, if you're Pope for a day, what's your, what's your action item? Um, I'd make sure that women in the Catholic Church could be ordained. All right. <laughs> Someone else said that recently. So, yeah, we need to get some movement oh, on that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm pretty sure it would take more than a day, even for the Yeah, probably. <laughs> we need to get some uh, – yeah, we need – speaking of structures that need to change, right? right? 
what uh, theological figure or Christian figure would you want to meet? You know, right now I am working on a devotional um, on Julian of Norwich. And uh, so I would love to pick her brain a little bit, but I'm not sure, you know, I was thinking like Julian of Norwich or Soren Kierkegaard or, um, or maybe Flannery O'Connor. I'm not sure these people would be people I'd want to like sit down and have a beer with though. Cause I'm not, (laughs) <laughs> I would just yeah. want to interview them or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so all of the really interesting people, I, I think I'd, I'd be a little too afraid of to have like, you know, uh, yeah. to be buddies with them. But um, interesting. Yeah, those, those are yeah. my top. Those are my top probably. I don't know. Um, yeah, those are good. Yeah. yeah. Um. Phyllis Tickle, who I imagine you're familiar with, and then there's an evangelical guy, Brady Shear, talks about this time and place like being the biggest change in 500 years. And you know, Phyllis Tickle talked about it, uh, compared it to like what the Great Schism and the Protestant Reformation and what have you, right? What do you think, like 500 years later? history will remember our current time and place for. You know, I, I just love Phyllis Tickle. She was one of those people who is not only like a great thinker and a great, she was just a beautiful person. Just so I just have to say that. Um, I'm, I'm just, a right, yeah. I was able to get to know her when she was alive. Um, I, you know, one thing, though, I will say that I had an argument with Phyllis Tickle about an argument in the pages. I never like would actually bring it up mm-hmm. to her face because, like I said, she was the sweetest person ever. And so I would be way too chicken to bring it up to her face. Um, <laughs> but but one thing that I did have an issue with is she in her book, uh, Great Emergence, when she talked about it, she would yeah. not even mention the fact that women had become ministers. And so there was like this sense that, uh, you know, because people were on the internet now and there was this giant shift and change in, um, in media that that would bring about, um, uh, the, this, um, change in Christianity, but she never mentioned in all of, all of her timeline, um, the fact that women became ministers. And to me, I think that was, that was a huge, I mean, granted it's only happened in a very small portion of Christianity. And even in those small places of Christianity, it's still, you know, we still have major, major barriers. Yeah, that's that's a great observation though, because I think even I'm seeing this in even some evangelical churches mm-hmm. where it's happening slowly, but it's happening. So that's, uh, that's a great observation. There's also a shift, I think, in um, you know our theology has been so focused on uh, the European male, and now have the yep. growing voice of the global South in theology. We have more and more people of color who are writing incredible theology. We have the womanist movement, the mujerista movement, the um, yeah. uh, so many liberation theologies that are are coming into uh, you know are are having voice these days, and the academy is p- uh, paying more attention to them, and they're becoming published more and more. Of course, we have a great way to go, but. But just the fact that um, that this is happening, it gives us an entirely different lens, an entirely different viewpoint um, it, with some of these major historical uh, doctrines that we've been working with for so many years. Yeah, so kind of to that trend then, how do you see that shaping Christianity to the point where like 500 years later, what do you think Christianity will look like? Well, hopefully um, we've done something about the planet or else there won't be humans. 
<laughs> 500 yeah. years. So hopefully we have a very strong, robust sense of stewardship in the environment. Um, and, you know, my hope and prayer is that um, Christianity will be uh, something that is more practiced um, than necessarily institutional. It seems that many of our um, many of our denominations are being shaken to the core, and not necessarily in a bad way. Um, you know, we're losing yeah. a lot of our churches. We're losing a lot of our property. We're losing a lot of um, things, which certainly make me sad. Uh, but. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, I think what is emerging is also very interesting because um, we have this younger generation uh, who is not going to church because it's some somehow socially mandated. You know, they're not going to church because their grandparents would be sad if they didn't. You know, <laughs> they're they're going to church because. They believe yeah. something and it's, it's important to them. And, um, and they could be a thousand other places, but they actually believe in what we're doing there. So I hope the seeds of that, um, and, uh, will, will really take root at this time. Um, so I, I, yeah, I have a lot of hope for, um, the future of Christianity. That's great. Well, where can folks find out more about you? Well, like I said, and I'll plug it again, hopefully I'll have a, a, a devotional coming out soon um, on Julian of Norwich. Um, I have a blog. Does everybody have a blog that's inactive? I have an inactive blog. <laughs> yeah. So so uh, I'm, I've joined the uh, countless ranks of inactive bloggers. Um, but you know, I have a blog on Christian century. Um, and I also have a Twitter account. That's probably where I'm most active. 140 characters or wait, no, it's changed. How many? 280, I think now, right? 80 characters at a time. Well, awesome. And of course your website, that's where I found out more about you. Carol Howard, org, right? That's it. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'm really looking forward to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna keep a lookout for that book on pastoral trauma and experience because I'm sure many pastors I know would like to read it, I, and I know I would. So thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate talking to you. And uh, peace be with thank you. Thank you, and peace be with you as well. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. But hey, before you go, do us a favor, subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people. Thanks and go in peace.